about it's the worst week of my entire life. Wilbur Ross is a socially prominent businessman with homes on Fifth Avenue, the Hamptons, and Palm Beach. He is also the chairman and principal owner of the company that took over the Sago mine just a few months ago. Would you call this a safe mine? I believe that the mine was fundamentally safe. You yes. really do? Yeah, I really do. You're known by some on Wall Street as a vulture investor, a, a bottom feeder, someone who goes in, buys up distressed, bankrupt industries, tries to cut costs and then sell them and make huge profits. Well, is, so that, is that an accurate description? No, I think if we had a bird, it wouldn't be the vulture. A vulture picks flesh off a dead carcass. And it turns out that the violations were well known to the billionaire chairman of the company back in New York. While there were violations, every mine in the country has violations. 208 violations, 96 of them significant or substantial, 13 D-level, you know what that means. Yeah. That, um, that means unwarranted failure. I, I understand what they how, mean. How could you operate a mine like that? Why would you keep it open with those records of violations? Well, you have to put it in the context of the industry. I mean, in I mean, every day men go down into those holes. I understand. Where, according to the records, and you've seen them, sure. the roofs keep falling in. They found combustible materials in there just weeks before this accident? Yeah. We, were you comfortable sending men into that hole? We were comfortable based on the assurances from our management that they felt that it was a safe situation. How recently had been the partial shutdown ordered by the government? I don't recall the exact date. Sometime in December? Uh, it might have been. might very well have been. And that didn't concern you? Everything concerns us. But, but thir we, 13 partial shutdowns, didn't you start sitting here in New York in your skyscraper suite, didn't you start to wonder whether this mine was perhaps about to blow? Well, uh, shutdowns and about to blow are not exactly the same circumstance. And how much has your company put in? Two million dollars. We put the first two million, two million dollars. and we're also Now, let me bearing. ask you, you're a billionaire by all accounts. How'd you come up with the figure of two million? It seems, uh, with all due respect, sir, sort of cheap. Well, uh, the board had a meeting, we decided that we would put the first two million dollars into the fund and to try to raise more money to help the workers. Firstly, put any money in? Uh, we own about a third of the company and we will decide what to do about a personal contribution as we see what comes in from outside. As the chairman, would you call that generous? We think it's a good start toward helping the people. British Petroleum's Chief Operating Officer, Doug Suttles, is overseeing the cleanup. Mr. Suttles, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Ann. At last report, you were weighing two uh, new solutions on parallel tracks, the so-called top hat to go over the leak, and also an insertion tube to siphon up the oil. Why would either of these untested solutions work when all others you've tried have failed? Well, Ann, I think, you know, we're going to try everything we can to stop this thing. But these two techniques, in theory, should work. I mean, we've got the same challenge we've had since the beginning, which is the 5,000 feet of water. And what we're trying to do is we have to find a way to keep these gas hydrates from forming, and we think both of these techniques should help with that. In the meantime, we're seeing stunning new images, uh, Doug, about how the uh, oil is impacting the coastal waters. Scientific experts are questioning whether your company has again underplayed the size of this leak. Some suggest it could be up to 26,000 barrels of oil at five times a day, your current estimate. Are you guessing, and if you don't know the true volume of this leak, how can you stop it? Well, and since the very beginning, we've said it's highly uncertain. And the two things we can do is we can watch what we observe on the seafloor, and we can see what happens on the surface. And what we do know is when we get good weather and can apply all, to all of our techniques, we can actually shrink this spill. We've actually done that. I think the number is, is probably reasonable, but I can tell you, actually, we're putting every resource against this problem. It isn't related to the, the amount coming out. We're actually applying everything we can. We've mounted the largest uh, response effort ever done in the world. But is it possible that you are actually leaking more than 5,000 barrels a day, yes or no? 
I think in it could be higher or lower. I don't think it's wildly different than that number, but it could be, we've said since the beginning, it could be a bit above or below. All right. A congressional hearing on Wednesday revealed that human and also mechanical errors contributed to this disaster, including a failed battery on what's called a blowout preventer, which is supposed to be the fail-safe that's supposed to prevent something like this from ever happening. How is it possible, given the risks, that there could be a faulty battery, a faulty battery on this blowout protector, sir? Well, and I'm only involved in the response. I mean, my, my focus since uh, two hours after this thing began has been about how do we get this thing brought to an end and how do we minimize the impact. But let me interrupt you. I'm I know that, but how is it possible? The, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're saying you're not involved. You don't know then why as a CEO? You don't know why there would be a faulty battery on this blowout preventer? I actually... Uh, Actually, and I don't. Uh, the investigation, I'm sure, will find that out if that was part of the factors, but I actually don't know. Well, well, part of what relates to you here is that there's a U.S. representative, Bart Stupak, who suggests now that your company, uh, and also Transocean, we should also add, inadequately maintain the blowout preventer at the very least. So, you know, do you want to sort of respond in terms of how your company operates with this kind of a thing? You know, and I think what I need to do, and I think what the people of this region want me to do, is bring this flow to a stop and actually minimize the impact. And that's what I work on every single day. There are other people worried about this investigation, and I'm sure they'll get to the bottom of it. Well, you know, the cleanup cost alone is now supposed to cost about $450 million. And, um, the, you know, there are liability claims in addition to this, sir, as you well know, people who've been hurt by this spill. And so the question, as a CEO, I need to ask you this morning, I know you're involved with the cleanup, but, but dealing with the price of tag of this thing you know do you is you are you now willing this morning to agree that your company is willing to go beyond the 75 million dollar cap on on these kinds of claims these liability kinds of claims you know and i think C-O-O, the estimate we sorry. had yesterday Yes, Ann. And, and, and as of yesterday, we'd already spent over $460 million. We're putting every resource to this. We're doing everything we can. The $75 million cap actually isn't material. We're doing everything we can. We've applied money, people. We have over 13,000 people working on this thing right now. I just don't think it's a relevant issue. So, so you're saying that there is no cap on how much you are willing to spend, not just for the cleanup, but for all of those people who say they've been hurt by this bill? You know, since the beginning, and we've said we're going to make this thing right. We're, we're going to deal with the impacts. We're going to ta- do what it takes to clean this thing up and stop the flow. And we've said that since the beginning, and we're still saying it. And I think our actions back that up. You know, uh, the pictures that we're showing, I want to show people again, you know, about the environmental impact because we don't know how much this thing is going to cost. Dolphins and turtles have washed up dead on shore. Scientists are trying to determine whether they or not they died of, of this oil contamination. But given the long-term impact from this bill, are you now, as the COO of British Petroleum, prepared to apologize to this country, to the American people, sir? You know, and what, what, what I think what I'm asking people to do is judge us on our actions. Uh, you know, we're out there doing everything we can, working with the government, working with the Coast Guard. Uh, and I'd actually ask people to say, look at what we do. Um, we're mounting the largest response ever. We're trying to immediately get money in people's hands right now to offset some of the impact. We're trying to employ the people who live in this region, the families that are impacted, put them to work so that actually we minimize those impacts. I think our actions is how we should be judged. So that's not an apology this morning. You know, and I think as we look at this, we'll find out who is at fault. We'll find out ultimately what went wrong. I think what people want to know is that we act responsibly. That's what the rules say, and that's who we are, and that's what we're going to do. British Petroleum COO Doug Suttles, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and good luck in your efforts. Thanks. Sir.